multiple award winning photographer. She um, has the accolade of being the woman who has won the most World Press Photo Awards, um, including the key award in 2010 for her photograph of Bibi Aisha, which was um, shown on the, which was um, shown as the cover of Time magazine that year. Um, Jody is not only a photographer, she also produces her own books. Um, she um, has a series of three artist monographs, um, one in Soweto, one on Between Dogs and Walls, and another on um, Real Beauty, which is shown upstairs. Um, Jody also works as a trainer, <clears throat> and as a teacher, and as a mentor to young photographers, um, specifically in South Africa, but also more generally around the world. She's traveled internationally doing workshops for young people, workshops for aspirants and student photographers, and so on. And um, most importantly, she has worked with the Market Photo Workshop in Johannesburg, which is one of the seminal schools of photography in the country, set up at the Goldblatt in the 1990s. And Jody has been working there as a mentor, as a trainer, as a teacher since 1996, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and yeah, that's where I met Jody. And so, uh, is there anything else I should say? Well, the work travels quite a lot. The work travels extensively, it's shown internationally um, in major museums. She's represented by major collections, including the Art of Walter collection and the Francois Pinot collection, which are two major international collections of not only photography, but of uh, but also African art. And She's Bloom also Bloom represented Bloom. in the Bloemfontein collection, yeah. um, in the Olivenais Art Museum collection, and the image in the middle over there is the one that they have in their collection. Um, yes, she's in a number of other South African museum collections. So, um, yeah, Jody Beaver. Thanks very much for coming, and thank you everyone at Olivenais for the beautiful exhibition that we could put up. Um, I think the best way to describe it is that in 1976, when Hector Peterson was killed, I was only 10 years old. And, um, you know, as a white South African, I lived in a middle class, back, a middle class suburb, and we had our, our domestic worker, Betty, and, of course, domestic workers know everything about your life, but you know very little about theirs. So, for me, photography eventually became the vehicle for me to, to be allowed to go and see what the rest of South Africa, the people in South Africa, were about. And I think that my influence came from, um, well, the work that you see here, we've called it Between Darkness and Light because I believe that we all have two sides to ourselves and it really depends upon your upbringing and what you're exposed to. And I think that um, traveling for all my years as a photographer working with real communities, you get to see that even in the most desperate of situations, there's a resilience amongst people um, to make or try have a better life for themselves. And, but at the same time, when I was working, I started at the Star newspaper. It was September 1993. And I worked with Ken Oosterbrook and Kevin Carter and Gary Bernard. Gary committed suicide. Kevin committed suicide. Uh, um, Abdul Sharif was killed, and Ken was killed in the crossfire in Tukosa. And so from me being in a very middle class, like naive space, from the first year that I worked, I was exposed to outside um, um, Tully, in Tully House, where all the IFP were killed, and suddenly like I woke up to what was happening in South Africa. But no one ever spoke to you about how psychologically things would impact on you. And that's when I created my first work. So I think my influence comes from the pre where you are, where I am in South Africa. Um, it comes from emotionally how I am feeling, and also it comes from how old I am. So when I first started, which we'll go into this room, Between Dogs and Wolves, growing up with South Africa, um, I came up with this another photographer 
uh, Stanley Green came up with the title, and the French for it is Entre Chien et Lou. And Entre Chien et Lou means you don't know if a dog is a wolf or a wolf is a dog. And basically, a good example for this was that um, I met a social worker um, at, because I was still freelancing for the Star newspaper. And he said he looked after the children at Park Station in Johannesburg. And I thought, please, can I come with you one night and photograph the children? And they stole his wallet. And he was nice and generous and whatever. And I took him in my car and we drove off to, to um, where he was staying. And I said, wow, I would have been so angry with those young children. And I thought, I said, you're so kind. And it happened to be Moses Satoli, the most notorious serial killer in South Africa. He had killed 48 women. And I think that, and the reason I was fine was because I was white, because serial killers have a profile, you know, and he would go to the station and he would pick up young black women coming from the trans guy in rural areas and he'd say, come with me, I'm a social worker. I'll take you to a place to stay and then he used to take them to the Cleveland mine dumps and kill them. So that's what it is. So it's a 10-year journey, and it's looking at the youth living on the fringe of society, which includes David. And it was just me exploring uh, young people living in, in, in South Africa. And I think you can... And, just to speak, because there's mainly a young crowd here, this was all shot on film. So, um, it's completely different when we move to Soweto, where I'm using a digital camera. So, I don't like really... So, what was included was, like, I worked with the gangs in Westbury, which was really interesting for six months. Um, there actually aren't any photos here of the gangs. But I worked with David Jacoby, a young white guy from Frieda Park, who basically, um, he, I met him, I was bored at the Strand newspaper, I had nothing to do, so I said, can I just go out into the world and shoot photos? And I went to Frieda Park, which is known as predominantly a very Afrikaans, this is in, in 95, Afrikaans, council, flat environment, um, and a lot of poor whites living there. Mainly they were working for the railways or for government positions. And I just met David Jacoby. This is David, right through. And I thought it would be an interest. He just had an absolutely brilliant character. And I just thought it would be interesting to spend, I don't know, I spent about three months with him photographing his life. And this, I think that um, people say, like, how did you do this? You know, like, or the illegal immigrant series. How did I, like, go and do this? Because in a way, I was naive, like, um, trusting the world. But also, my analysis is that if you're walking in the streets of Hillbrow, right, there's a good likelihood you might get mugged because you're a stranger. But if you create relationships, even if they are people are criminals, they're still people, and they also have a good side to them. They have moms or dads or they don't. And so I always in, went into a community with a very open mind. I don't lie to people what I'm going to do with the work. And I offer a lot of photographs to the people. And... I managed um, to work in this environment. Um, David used to sell himself sometimes for like five rand or ten rand. He used to give a blow job in Bramfontein. Um, and they used to go and all the, the old parking meters, they used to chop them off. And you have to make decisions as a photographer. So, you know, if someone wants to, like David would say, would I mind like taking this... Um, parking meter in my car and I'd have to say no 
or can we borrow your car? We want to like move some furniture, knowing that it's probably a robbery. And it was a very interesting experience. How do I know when to leave an environment? And I think I just, I, I get a sense that, the, that, it, I don't know, the protection or the relationship is shifting, not in a negative way, it's a close relationship, but the protection that's surrounding me feels to be weakening. For example, in David's case, someone got out of jail and started saying, well, if you take, if you basically like taking photographs of David, you should help us do other things. And David said, absolutely not. But it was very interesting, because I don't know if you believe in this stuff, but in the exact area, there was a clairvoyant. And she said to me, I'm warning you, don't let anyone get into your car. They, someone's going to ask you to get into the car, and there's going to be a death. And the friend from was killed in a robbery. So, but the, these are things that, I don't know, when you're working in it and you, you're with people, it's like we make too many judgments, I think. So that's my humanity part. But let's go into a, a project that has, it's, it's a traditional narrative. Um, Pro Helvetia, which is the Arts Council of Switzerland, they asked 10 photographers around the world to look at borders. Now, I lived in Troyville, which is an immigrant area in Johannesburg. And basically, um, the one night I was driving down a bridge, and I saw these men, you know, being held down. Um, and it was the cops. And they were immigrants. And I thought, you know, with what's happening in South Africa, this was in 2000. Um, the police were, were going on a huge bust um, in Hillbrow. And so what I did was I gained permission from the police uh, to go with them on this bust. And it was like about, I don't know how many, like many policemen, hundreds of policemen just running into buildings and looking for illegal drugs and illegal immigrants. And so it starts off with, I didn't know I got this picture, but here you've got black label. You know, because when you're in the situation, you're just moving and you, you look at, you're just shooting and it's wild and crazy. And I thought that was very interesting. And then what happens was the South Af the police then put people into the van and they go to Lindella. And Lindella is a repatriation center near Krugersdorp. And at that time, there were thousands of being, people being arrested in, in South Africa. So there was overcrowding. To get into, if, if the photographer's here, to get into a, a place like Lindella takes a lot of hard work because it's not that easy to get in. And Lindella at that time was, seemed to be corrupt. And people are just picked off the streets without their things and taken to Lindella. And then this was incredible to me because for me it's sort of, this is now what happens is that they, 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 they document each person and then the Mozambicans and the Zimbabweans, that's who I followed. Um, they put onto trains, like a milk train that stops at every single um, station on the way to Mozambique. Pakistanis, Bangladeshians, anyone from further afield might have to stay in Lindella for many months because the government will only um, send them home, which is a flight, if there's a full flight. And it's very ex expensive to send illegal uh, people from Pakistan and that home. And so I thought, let me follow the Mozambiques because I don't, I don't know if you remember Mozambique had the flights in 2000. They had them again, and there was also, I'll tell you, you all know about xenophobia now, right? When I did this project, no one knew what xenophobia. This work, through all the xenophobia attacks that have happened, has been used by the immigrants themselves to show what they feel happens to them. This was exhibited on um, um, 
you know the church in, in town, in Johannesburg, where all the Zimbabweans were staying? It was exhibited on the outside of the church. It was ripped down four times, including the artist statement. No one knows by who. This was more recently. So this work keeps being shown and shown. Now everyone knows about xenophobia. But for me, I, I thought of like Germany during Second World War when I look at a photo like that or like that. And this captain of the police, this, he was a captain of the train. 50% of the train jumped off as the train started. They paid a 100 rand bribe, the two policemen in the carriage, and as the train was moving, people jumped off. It's very dangerous because, you know, you could hit a pole. And he was suspended. I think he probably was fired because the Mail and Guardian were on the same um, train as me and they exposed what was happening. And, at every, and also here you see there and there the policemen shout Schafkop, which means you have to put your head in between your legs so you don't run away or you don't jump off the train, even though they did. And then what I did was I put my money in my sock and I jumped off the train with some of the, when we got to Mozambique, and then I, fought, I stayed at, uh, um, because of the floods, I stayed with, with the nuns who were looking after the orphans, and I, I traveled to, 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 to Chokwe, where in Chokwe there was, I mean, there was absolutely, not Chokwe, um, I forget, it's a beautiful place where people go on holiday. Anyway, you had to like pay to take a boat on a road because of the floods. And I call the project Going Home because the immigrants going home. And the, the, the weird thing about this is that people pay 100 rand to jump off the train and most of the people who remained on the train wanted to go back home for a while. So, yeah, so that's, yeah. Sorry, if I can ask, over a period of how many days did this all happen? Well, it happened in different bursts. So, for example, this happened over one night. Oh, yes. And then this happened over 24 hours. Not this, until here. And then I spent two weeks in Mozambique. In Mozambique. But I also did some work on, on the people that had lost homes. Oh, right. But... Another lesson for photographers is that I got permission from Home Affairs to go twice on the train. And because they were exposed in the media, the second time I went on the train, no one was jumping off the train. And so I just slept. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked for 24 hours. So I didn't, while everyone was sleeping on the train, I was photographing, running up and down. So this was like between, like this was the more dark mood of my work.